So hello everybody, my name is Sunil. Uh, I'm one of the co-founders of a company called Sightail. Uh, not Skytail, not Sitali. There's a variety of ways that I'm sure you were looking at that word and trying to figure out how to pronounce it. It's pronounced Sightail. Um, I'm going to take you through 15 minutes of who we are, what we do, and then Ryan, one of my colleagues, is going to go through a demo of some of the code that we're working on as well. Uh, we're going to be here. We are uh, a workbench company. In fact, I'll jump right into it right now. Uh, we started the company 18 months ago. Uh, we just uh, raised a round of capital, Workbench. Thank you guys. It's one of our uh, newest investors, but we've got a lot of other great investors as well that have joined us. Uh, 24 people in New York, San Francisco, Argentina, and around the world. Um, I'll talk more about hiring at the end of this if any of you are interested mm -hmm. in joining us as well. Now, uh, what we're going after is the fact that the world that we're looking at right now, all of you, your startups, your enterprises, are finding themselves filled with all kinds of interesting technologies that exist in the open source, whether it's new databases, new queuing systems, new operating systems. And this stuff, no matter how much you'd like to think that it's not finding its way into your organization, is finding its way into your organization. And if that's the, tr if that's the case, what ends up happening is that a lot of folks, particularly folks in the security organizations, have a difficult time figuring out what's supposed to be here, what's not supposed to be here as well. And so this is only going to get worse because we are at the very beginnings of this cloud adoption model. You might have heard the word cloud over the last 10 years. Most organizations aren't at the point where they're really diving in here and really using this stuff. So one of the challenges that happens when people start going into cloud and they start to adopt technologies is this idea of service identity begins to fracture. So what's service identity? Well, you've probably heard a term called monolithic application development. How many people have heard that term here, just so I know? from a context, very few, okay. <laughs> Monolithic application development is when you have an application that is very tightly coupled, right? Everything, every building block of the app is built lockstep with each other, which means that anytime you wanna make a change to it, all the pieces of it have to be changed at the same time. Uh, and it creates a slow velocity of making changes to that application. So as a result of that, you've seen a movement called microservices. How many people have heard of microservices? Mm -hmm. Okay, of course. So, Microservices is basically the idea of decoupling all of that so that you can have one component developed and deployed independently of another component so that you can move faster is the bottom line for this. When you move to microservices architectures, whether you're a small company or a large company, what ends up happening is that this idea of the identity of your application suddenly now exists in multiple places. I might have one foot in Amazon. I might have one foot in Azure. I might have one foot in this thing called Kubernetes as well. And now I've got three identities for something that used to have one identity. The problem with that is that that breaks all of how your security organizations think about securing that application, okay? So this led us to having to think about how we need to rethink service identity. And what that led us into doing is we went back into the archives and we figured there's probably a few companies out there who have had to think about this problem as they've evolved and become a highly distributed microservices-centric business. Google, Facebook, Netflix on this slide, Twitter, JPMC, uh, a number of other organizations as well we went and talked to. All of them had started to realize that the key for them to continue to build at high velocity was the idea of creating something called identity management for microservices, which basically means for every given piece of code you have running in your business, you give it a driver's license. And what is a driver's license? It's an identity. It defines a set of attributes of what you're allowed to do, and you carry it with you wherever you go. So if you think about software, software does the same thing. Instead of having the infrastructure or the application react to the infrastructure, the infrastructure reacts to the application itself. So wherever it goes, it knows, oh, you have a valid driver's license. I can follow you around and enforce the security policies that I used to otherwise enforce in one location <laughs> as a whole. This was our inspiration for our company in terms of thinking about how to bring identity management for microservices to everybody other than companies that look like this. And there's a lot. One of the key parts of this infrastructure that they built is this idea of multi-factor authentication. How many of you use RSA two-factor authentication for your organizations? Okay, Duo or any one of that, those ilk, right? That is basically what these organizations ended up doing with their identity system for software. They basically said, our software could run today here, tomorrow there, and so we need to have this idea of multi-factor authentication so that we can interrogate and say, are you who you say you are before I give you an identity so that you can talk to whatever other systems you need to talk to as a whole. And so these are just examples of the kinds of questions that you might want to be able to ask of a system before you give an identity. But the reality is that it could be anything you want. 
uh, for all intents and purposes. So this was the core of uh, their offering, and you know, we talked a little bit about multi-factor and what, what it really means. The real key thing for most organizations is that when you start to think about identity as your core form of uh, identifying something as opposed to an IP address, all of a sudden, you could take advantage of all of the great cloud platforms that are out there without having to worry about being bound to technologies that are not and, not will, be, and will not be flexible enough for your businesses as you move fast and fast. From that, we built this thing called Spiffy. Okay? Uh, Spiffy is an acronym that stands for Secure Production Identity Framework for Everyone. Yes, it's a mouthful. But what it's designed to do mm -hmm. is it's designed to actually provide an abstracted way of how to think about identity for a software system. And it was built over the last 18 months with a number of large, great partners, adopters like you see here on the screen, and it's now housed as a project, an open source software project, within the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, whose anchor project is this thing called Kubernetes for the developers in the room here. Um, we are now part of that organization, and we started off with Spiffy. But Spiffy is just a specification. Along with Spiffy, we built this thing called Spire. And Spire is the actual software that does something with Spiffy so that you can bring identity to your microservices. Now with that, I'm gonna cut it over to Ryan who's gonna take you through a quick demo of Spire working in action. And I will warn those Hello. of you now Hello. in advance, Hello. this Hello. is a command line driven uh, <laughs> demo, which means half of you will probably check your phones, that's okay. For the rest that's of you that okay. actually care, we've made the font big enough for all of you so you'll be able to see it. Okay. Hi there, I'm Ryan Nelson. Uh, I lead up field engineering uh, at Cytel. Uh, I am a former New Yorker. Uh, I used to run operations for Major League Baseball for about 10 years. Um, uh, it's good to be back in town, um, but these days I split my time between Cytel's offices in San Francisco and my home in Seattle. Um, today I'm gonna demo Spire, which is a software that's a reference implementation, like it's a reference implementation of the spiffy, spiffy specification. I get paid to say spiffy specification <laughs> a lot. Um, uh, so uh, let me see. Um, so this demo is going to be just uh, two Nginx servers talking to each other over uh, mutual TLS uh, connection that's built on top of uh, spiffy trust domains. Uh, one is a simple uh, uh, front end load balancer, uh, and it's going to proxy over that uh, mutual TLS connection. Uh, to a, a simple web server, which we'll call blog. Uh, and the connection between the two uh, uh, mandates that the, the SSL certificate, the TLS certificates between the two have valid spiffy, uh, spiffy IDs, which we'll uh, dive into in a minute. Um, so first I will start my server. Can you guys sort of see that? I've got a bigger window for bigger fonts for the, the deep stuff. Uh, I'm gonna start up my server. Um, and now we'll start talking to it. Oops. Um, hey server, what do you know? Nothing. Okay, so uh, let's uh, uh, bootstrap up. First we'll add our host and bootstrap it into a domain, uh, or into our trust domain. Um, there's a lot of observable ways that you can uh, bootstrap a, uh, and, and start building a trust environment without entering a password. Uh, we support things like uh, Amazon, uh, Identity access management, uh, or similar similar offerings from Azure and Google and all the all the big clouds, and with those you can uh, you can get a certificate from the Amazon services that prove concretely through observation that I am an Amazon instance and I am an Amazon instance that's being paid for by Sunil, and not only that but I am a member of his auto scaling group B, and so that oh anybody who meets those criteria. I'll give you your spiffy ID, and you can generate certificates, and, and that's your driver's license that you can take around. Um, <coughs> uh, we can also use things uh, for physical servers. We can use things like uh, uh, hardware security managers, um, TPMs, YubiKeys, things like that. But for this demo, I'm going to use the simplest method and just generate a join token. So. So uh, I'm going to do Spire Server Token Generate Spiffy ID Spiffy colon slash slash your trust domain, which for this is example.org, and it says host. So it gives me the secret key, and with the secret key, I can go back and start up my agent with the join token. And it joins, and you can see it start to talk to the server. 
Um, so now, if I ask my server, what do you know? Now I have an entry. Uh, and this is, uh, uh, it's got a parent ID based on the join token. That, that, that's, the, that's the observable secret so that I know you are who you say you are. Uh, and with that, you can start handing out uh, your driver's license, which is uh, spiffy example org slash host. Um, so let's uh, build on top of that. Uh, we're going to add two more entries, uh, one for our blog server and one for our front end load balancer. Um, and those things will leverage the ho agent on the host to attest to certain criteria that we say must be in place or else your, uh, your identity is invalid. Um, so I'll do Spire Server Entry Create um, Parent ID of the host. So I'm building on the foundation of, of the, the first entry I did. Uh, we'll give it a spiffy ID. Uh, of example.org slash host slash blog. Um, and then we'll, uh, we'll attest to certain criteria, and that's with my selectors. And this one is Unix UID 1000, which is the Nginx blog user uh, in this Linux environment. And I'll give it a time to live uh, TTL of 10 seconds because I want to iterate really fast for this demo. So I'll do that. And then I'll create something similar, um, except I'll change it to front end. And I'll change my selector to mandate that instead of UID 1000, we'll just be UID 0, which is root, also with a TTL of 10. Uh, so with that, I can say, hey, server, what do you know? And now we have these three entries, uh, one for the host, uh, one for blog, which uh, builds on top of the parent ID of host uh, and mandates uh, that we have a UID of 1000. Uh, the other one mandates that we have a UID of 0. Um, so back here, I will, nope. Start up my Nginx uh, for the blog server. Start up my Nginx uh, with a configuration file for the front end. Uh, and you can see up at the top that it's joining the servers and starting to mint these uh, SSL certificates. Um, and then it'll be doing that over and over again because I've only given them 10 seconds to live. Um, and so these are passing these around, and down here in the corner you can see uh, that I have a, a curl running in a loop that has started to work now because my server is up. And I can show you something really cool like, maybe, ta-da. So uh, this works, this is uh, uh, perhaps the most secure way to display <laughs> a logo of an, of an open source version. Um, not a tremendously compelling demo. So uh, what we'll do is uh, try and make it more compelling by uh, breaking stuff. Uh, so let's go back to my terminal. And again, we've got these three entries. And things are working behind the scenes. I swear to God, because these things exist. Um, so let's prove that theory by uh, killing one of them. Um, John just told me you've got all the time you need. OK. <laughs> um, <laughs> so <laughs> no pressure. Uh, so uh, deleted one. Uh, I'll go back to the, to the, the, the logs. Uh, my SSL cache uh, in Nginx will expire in about 10 seconds. My TTL will uh, expire in about another 10 seconds. And here shortly, um, things will stop working. Ta-da. Uh, so just as easy as that. Uh, and if I go back and recreate this blog one, it's back in existence. Um, iterate a couple of times. And we're back in business. Um, All right, we're going to have to leave it at that. OK. Uh, so uh, thank you. <laughs> I'm Ryan C. Nelson on Twitter, or Ryan at Saito.io. We have time for, time for Q and A. All right, and I'm going I'm to put something um, up on the screen. So, so for those of you that are in infrastructure, you will actually be going apeshit over that one. Uh, because of the fact that what he just showed you, on the order of weeks, sometimes months in some organizations to do, okay? For some of organizations. What we've done basically is we've automated the entire process 
of how any given software system gets an identity and then how we enforce that that identity is legitimate and valid and then how you can kill it at any moment and then it kills everywhere in your infrastructure very, very, very quickly, right? That is the problem set that we're going after and we're trying to uh, do that with the large community. We've got folks that are contributing code. So if you want to learn more about this, you can go to uh, Connect, uh, which is where this is our Slack channel. If you want to contribute code, you can go to that one called Contribute. And if you want to work with a, bi a bunch of crazy dudes like us, you can go to the last one as well. Uh, thank you for your time. I guess we have time for two questions. So, sure. Questions from anybody? Yes. Um, so, I did follow the demo. And, uh, so, AWS is famously known for having VPNs, and a lot of enterprises work behind VPNs. Mm -hmm. How does it work with it, and how do you support GDPR? Okay. So, his question was, uh, Amazon and other cloud providers um, use networking technologies to provide a secure way to connect one piece of infrastructure to another piece of infrastructure using this thing called VPC. Uh, VPC creates an, a VPN between two sites, right? Uh, and then your second part of your question was, how does this work with GDPR? And how does it help to uh, enforce GDPR? Is that your question? You interact with it, but how does it, how does it affect it? How does GDPR affect this? Got it, okay. So I'll take the first question as well. This has nothing to do with network. You can do VPN to your heart's galore, right? You can keep every bit of network infrastructure and complexity you want uh, because it operates from an OSI standpoint at a lower level than what we're talking about. We're talking at, at the application layer. So this just transport over whatever network protocol, whatever network path you exist and have in place. So your network engineers, they don't even need to know about this to be completely honest with you because it has no impact on what they do today. The second part of your question, I, I suspect you might have a second question about that. We can talk about that afterwards. The second part of this question was about GDPR. How many people here know what GDPR is? <laughs> okay, good. Um, how does this impact GDPR? So uh, the idea of GDPR is that people, one of the things that comes up is people want to be able to know that if I have data in a certain locality that it's not going to find its way in another locality. It could be a, geo a geography, it could be a continent, it could be even down to the context of a country, if you will. One of the things that you could do here is you could choose to create policies and labels on these systems that say that any data that's associated with this system is only allowed to connect with other systems that are in that locality if you want to. And that any time you have another system that chooses to connect and interact with another database, for example, it cannot because there is a rule set called the GDPR rule set, for example, that you've designated and indicated that anything that has that rule has to be adhered to. So any connection attempt that uh, happens between a system that is in a GDPR zone and not in the same zone would not even happen, which means data would never even pass over the wire itself. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, second question. Time for one more quick one. Yes. Hi. Hey. Uh, so does this implement into Istio and Kubernetes well? Like yes. Can you can just drop it into that? Because uh, the whole point of Istio, one of the points is mutual TLS between services mm -hmm. um, and just kind of out of the box. So I'm curious if like, this embeds into that or? Yeah. Uh, did, did everybody hear that question? Okay, um, I'll wait for the mic, yeah. Uh, his question was, does this drop in with technologies like Istio and, you said Kubernetes? Kubernetes. Okay, Envoy. Yep, or Envoy, or a lot of these bleeding edge uh, cloud native technologies, if you will. Um, the answer is yes, it does. Uh, in fact, Istio uses Spiffy under the covers to actually do authentication for its own infrastructure. So you get Spiffy built in, in some form or fashion, if you're gonna go down the path of using Istio. Kubernetes as well, uh, it's a little bit more of a complex story. I'll say that we're working on that one. Okay. Joe Beta, who founded Kubernetes, came up with Spivy. Uh, yes, I should say that. <laughs> yes. So the founder of Kubernetes founded this too. So there's some uh, motivations to see those two things work together. We're buddies. Very, very nice. Uh, thank you for your time. I appreciate it. Thanks.